everyone and welcome to the noon session of the 2020 Open Simulator Community Conference. In this session, we are happy to introduce a panel discussion called The New Platforms. And our panelists are Adam Frisbee, Caitlin Meeks, Kalila Lakeworth, Lacey Sansar, and Mal Burns. Mal Burns is the host of In World Review, a weekly news and discussion program which has been running for over 10 years. He runs uh, MetaWorld Broadcasting to provide input and output services for TV, InWorlds, and the expertise for the same. Adam Frisbee is the CEO of SineWave Entertainment and a major developer of the SineSpace platform. Caitlin Meeks is the co-founder and CEO of Tivoli Cloud VR, formerly of Hyde Fidelity Inc. and Unity Technologies. Halila Lakeworth is the founder and leader of Vercadia Project, and Lacey Sansar is the community manager for Sansar. Please check out the website found at conference.opensimulator.org for speaker bios, details of the sections, and the full schedule of events. The session is being live streamed and recorded, so if you have questions or comments during the session, you may send tweets to at OpenSimCC with the hashtag OSCC20. And welcome, everyone. Let's begin the session. Well, thank you, Leah, for a kind introduction there. I'm going to have to correct you before we go any further. Uh, firstly, um, uh, well, I, um, we, um, I and James Outlaw do Meta World News, which we broadcast from Sansar, in fact, these days. In World Review is uh, done from OpenSim, but we don't do it weekly at the moment. We just do it when required. Also, um, as pointed out here, um, Adam has just said he's actually known as the Chief Product Officer. See this? That's his official title. And um, what you missed out there, which I think is quite important for us here, is that if you don't know, Adam was also one of the founders of OpenSim here, way about when, uh, before he uh, moved with, to Science Space and all that. But, you know, we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for people like Adam and, of course, later on, uh, um, uh, um, Crystal Lopez, you know, with the hypergrid. So, so anyway, uh, back to the panel. Now, um, <coughs> Part of this panel is something we sort of had last year. We, we did have a, a brief look at what was happening um, with um, the open source code that Philip Rosedale left behind when he closed down High Fidelity. Um, two of the, um, I, I believe Kitely is still offering a solution on that front, but two of the, the, the main contenders here, they've got slightly different procedures and things in the back end, but they are not sort of collaborating now, um, is, um, let me see, uh, Vicadia, which is um, Kalila's uh, platform here, and uh, Tivoli, or Tivoli Cloud, as I think I should really call it, um, which is uh, Caitlin's baby, as it were. Um, now, also in the course of the year, I think it's this year anyway, uh, Linda Nab, the, the makers of Second Life, um, who have been working on a new platform that they thought was going to take over the world, <laughs> uh, gave up on it, or rather they sold it uh, to a company called Wookie. And uh, that platform is called Sansar. And uh, Lacey here is um, the uh, community manager for Sansar. Sansar is also um, primarily publicizing events, um, like I think everybody here is really. Um, but uh, the thing that all these um, platforms have in common in my opinion, is they all, there will be others, but all these allow user created content. And um, some of it complex, some of it less so, some of it that you have to create outside and then import. But uh, generally speaking, um, it feels much more like it's in the spirit of uh, what we had here with OpenSim. And indeed, uh, Wall Garden, though it is, Second Life is very much based on its user created content. With the um, COVID pandemic on the loose all over the world, in fact, uh, there's been a massive increase of people coming online. But it's very strange. Um, as I mentioned, I think yesterday, talking to Ken, it seems to me that some of us old timers, as it were, and I'll say Second Life, Open Sim, 
um, the science of place, the, the works, haven't necessarily benefited, benefited from that. You know, sort of, uh, I'm very fond of saying that, you know, a year ago, um, I'll give you a Skype call was a, a ubiquitous sort of expression, wasn't it? Well, now everybody's forgotten Skype and they're all talking about Zooming. I mean, <laughs> Zoom fatigue more to the point. And it's so it's so strange how the, the pandemic has brought a lot of people online, but their destinations have not been quite what we thought they were. And I'm also going to ask our guests to maybe if they are addressing that in any, any way, how they how they feel about that. The best way is to you know encourage people to join um, what effectively I still call uh, the metaverse. So I'm, I'm going to just run around all four of the, my guests to get a little update um, from them, so to speak, um, like events coming up and things. And I know, Lacey, for example, you've got um, Lost Horizon, uh, uh, amongst others, launching really big stuff throughout December on Soundstar anyway. Do you want to give us a little plug for that before we go any further? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. There's uh, 10 different events going on um, inside of uh, Sansar. Uh, the folks from Glastonbury, Shangri-La, we did something earlier this year in uh, July. And uh, if you want to check out more on that, it's actually LostHorizonLive.com, and it, it should give you instructions on how to join. Um, the exciting part for this time is that we are actually not just on a you know PC, so you can actually join into these events on your mobile phone and yes. uh, recently a browser. So come in and join. It should be a lot of fun. Uh, from Infected Mushroom to uh, Little Gay Brother and beyond, there's all sorts of bands <laughs> playing. <laughs> so I hope to see you there. Yes, I mean, my, I, I was very impressed early in the year with the, uh, um, the the Glastonbury event replacing the real thing, um, uh, Shangri-La. I mean, the um, the use of real live performers, obviously pre-filmed on the green screen, who were superimposed onto the virtual stage, and you really had to be really close up to the stage to actually realise they weren't there. You know that they were actually mm -hmm. flat, flat two D. So um, very excellently produced. Now. Um, mm -hmm. um, let me see. I, Adam, you've you've had quite a few events in. Um, oh, I'm trying to remember the name of that band again. Well, it's a, it was earlier in the year. <laughs> <laughs> My memory is not very good these days, but we remember we came and uh, there was a band there, wasn't there? Doing a sort of they were doing a sort of tour of various locations. Uh, you, unfortunately, that really doesn't nail it down this year. We've had so many, um, so many events and activities this year. Right. I mean, okay. our our um, our pivot though has been more this year. It's been very good for us on the sort of the education and the on the corporate side of things, uh, which has been a little bit less public focused. Um, which is really next year's next year's big primary for us. But no, this year's been great for us. I mean, obviously the pandemic pandemic is terrible for everyone else, but uh, for us, it's been um, it's been quite rejuvenating. We've had a lot of inbound interest, um, so much so we actually had to close off from new clients um, about three months ago, uh, just because the, the level of work we we're getting was absolutely nuts, um, which is, yeah, it's absurd, but uh, we've it, been, it's funny it's been think, worth it. It's funny to think that some people really are benefiting here, you know. Our government in Brittany has just announced that they, they plan to bring in some new taxes for the people, the profiteers of the pandemic, which is, seems fair enough, I suppose. But yes, um, even uh, I mean, I gather the Second Life had, even had to close close off new, I don't know about new users, but certainly new land and stuff because they can cope up with the demand and you know how expensive they are. So <laughs> who knows? Um, OK, Kalila. Um, of 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 the platforms, you're probably the lesser um, known in terms of PR and stuff. But I do know that you you hold quite a few things there. Obviously, uh, most of the information I get it tends to come through Discord channels and Twitter feeds and stuff. You know, so um, but maybe um, a little summary of what you're up to and will be up to. Well, uh, what we're up to in terms of events, we've been we've been pretty busy with that. Not nearly as busy as some of you guys, but um, we've been helping more of an international audience out with events. So, for example, we've had uh, Asia being a focus lately, um, specifically Taiwan, Japan. We've held events for startups in on location, and then. Uh, 
allowed them to all collaborate with each other because typically what would happen is they would get together for conventions in a physical space, but that's just impossible. So what we did differently is allowed them to host smaller events individually there and then bridge them through Vercadia. Honestly, the way I see it is we are more enablers than hosts or implementers. Um, so if you have a need, we let people join up, use the open source platform, and keep the world that they create. And so, yeah, we've been uh, doing it that way. So when you say enabler, do you, um, do you see it as taking on clients and maybe charging them a little bit or something and then keeping them uh, uh, keeping a presence there for them or are you also including public you know just general users who might begin to start logging in and want to create their own little parcels and things oh well we support both right uh yeah. it's supposed to be open of course you can only focus on so much at any different time because you know we can't we're not a yeah. company we're a volunteer open source project and sure. so we don't yeah. take on clients as the vercadia project it's really up for whoever is available oh, cool. and wants to work on things so the whole vercadia community has come together to serve these clients and it's actually worked out remarkably well <laughs> because yeah. as you see we've had some pretty big events and they actually uh, didn't blow up so <laughs> Yeah. It was a silly question, really, when I came thinking, well, of course you're open source. Why did I ask <laughs> if you're making money? Yeah, um, funny, I think. Now, Caitlin, of course, uh, you're in, um, uh, you're, uh, uh, well, I'll come to that in a minute. How, you, of course, have been doing various events here, there, and everywhere. I and mean, I, I, I know the one I sort of, uh, well, I even popped into the one with the, uh, is it San Francisco? It was, a, it was an educational thing. There was a doctor oh, there. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So you've been providing an event space, so presumably not yeah. just for um, parties, sure. but for education. Yeah, that, that's right. Well, we've done our, our share of like parties and things. We had um, the lockdown dance parties, which were fundraisers that um, we, we used for every person who attended. We computed a certain number of work units to folding at home to fight COVID um, and completed quite a lot. We had three or four of those. Um, and the idea was just to have, you know, a place where you could gather and party during the lockdown. Um, although we have been working more on R&D and just developing our platform than event, um, than hosting and, and like uh, recruiting events yet. Um, but we did have a, a pilot program for the last semester uh, with Simon Fraser University out of Vancouver. And um, with the university, we um, like kind of facilitated uh, their cognitive science department um, so that they were able to provide instruction in uh, Tivoli Hall, which is kind of our, our um, lecture hall environment. And that had about 200 students who participated, uh, most not in VR, but but a lot of them. And the instructor very much enjoyed uh, uh, teaching from within VR. So we've been, uh, the events that we've had, we've been using a bit like um, kind of information gathering sort of experiences to sort of further refine our platform and, um, you know, so that we can develop it to better support events like this in the future. Um, we're very much uh, like looking forward to having um, more events, you know, in the coming coming years. But we we do um, have plans to becoming, you know, um, a platform that that universities and other uh, you know learning institutions are interested in using. I must say the one that we were mentioning just now. Um, Vancouver, I think you said it was. Didn't you? It's, um, it got a lot of media publicity afterwards, I yeah. noticed, which um, I, I, it really brings it to mind. Um, I, I remember, um, you know, my RSS fees were bringing in quite a few little posts about events, and then I looked at the small print and said, In Sasa! Oh, <laughs> that's right, right, in, in Tivoli. Uh, I've got it wrong. In yeah. Tivoli Cloud, that was right. And, you know, it's, um, but it was in small print, you know, the main focus was on the event itself. It, which, it made it to, uh, to, to Vancouver, you know, TV news, certainly. That's right, Although, yeah. Uh, 
boy, remind me to make sure that when a news story is done, that it actually mentions the name of the core product being used. Yeah. I did uh, play on our news, that clip from the uh, TV news. I, I grabbed you. it. I grabbed it and included it in our news. It was only two minutes. So we, do that. we, we do that with short clips. Yeah. Now, uh, while we're on the subject, before we move on a bit, um, this is really for Kalila and Caitlin combined. Um, this time last year, and of course you were here last year, Kalila, um, we, you know, I had a similar discussion and, you know, you were both basically working with um, the open source code that Philip Rosedale had let go of um, when um, he, he finished High Fidelity. And at that time, they were very separate projects. And of course, they, they, they are now. But following the, the uh, discords and all the other things I, I um, follow, I, I picked up on the fact that you, the two of your platforms are now sort of maybe you're going to be beginning to collaborate a bit. I, I'm not up on the technical details i just remember one of you posted something and i liked it and the other said whoops <laughs> so yeah, do you maybe do you have any plans to sort of work together in a cohesive way that i can we can understand or is it just a um because they are yeah the way you're using the open source code is slightly different isn't it you're not yeah you're not well, duplicates of each other's platform we, we do have different approaches. Um, you know, Vercadia, as Kalila mentioned, is, is a volunteer uh, open source collective who are really effective and um, uh, very productive. Whereas in Tivoli, we're, we're a type B corporation, but we're also open source. Um, in terms of, of working together, I'll defer to Kalila on, on that, but we're we are um, also working with another community member who wants to create kind of a um, kind of an ag uh, uh, an agnostic sort of working group that yeah. can sort of maintain the protocol standards, um, so that if we diverge, uh, or we already do diverge a bit, but um, as we diverge, that we may still perhaps uh, have a degree of interoperability. The same way that, you know, when HTTP landed, um, you know, there was the W3 consortium sort of played a role in um, defining and maintaining the protocols. Exactly. I, yeah. I, I will, you know. That's something I've always, you know, so sad that we didn't have anything like that. Like, um, yeah. So, uh, so we so do now build have. the virtual worlds like we did the web. Yeah. And and there is now, in fact, this this W three working group um, called the the HFVRP working group. If you'd like to to join. Um, HFVRP. Yeah, high fidelity virtual reality platform. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> uh, which is kind of the official name that that Lind, um, Linton, that high fidelity gave the platform at sure. you know after it was sunset. Um, but I, I can't speak for Kalila, of course. Yeah, but, well, um, Kalila, any comments but, on this? Yeah. Well, I, uh, I do love what we're doing, and I, I do love the high fidelity platform, to be honest with you. Uh, when I had started Vercadia, I could have picked from any open source code base, right? Could have been anything, but... I figured that that is the best place to start from, given how much work they had done. You know, Philip really had a vision, and that's, and that's basically what set the foundation for what we have now. Um, but the way I see interoperability is it's not just high fidelity code. That's the thing. I think it's much wider than that, right? I don't imagine metaverse in the way of, say, Ready Player One. I imagine it in more the likes of the internet. And so I think to myself, interoperability is a lot deeper than that. And I'm thinking about things, not just high fidelity virtual reality platform, but things like WebXR, you know? Right. So that seems like so far apart, but in reality, what I would like to do is establish interoperability on a much wider level. And it's hard to do interoperability period, right? Because you would have to focus on your own platform and then try to collaborate with others. And if you don't have much time, let alone a company backing you, it's quite difficult. But I think it's worth pursuing in the wider context. So yeah, I see many opportunities for it to naturally evolve, to be honest with you. Uh, not easy, not, not one bit, but I think definitely on the roadmap. 
Yeah, I think the problem is there is no existing protocol for, I mean, the closest we ever came to it was VRML, wasn't it? You know, <laughs> way back when there's been nothing that really is a set of rules that, you know, can be built on. But one I think is actually rather interesting um, is um, to extend this a little bit. Um, well, I'll start. Um, no, I'll actually ask you, Caitlin and Khalida first. Have you any plans to or, um, be, be able to bring your platform out of a dedicated platform and onto, say, something like a web page or a, a mobile app? Of, um, is that on the horizon for um, for Kado or um, Javoli? Well, um, it, I mean, it all depends on the implementation. Uh, High Fidelity did indeed have an Android app, for example. And so, yes, the platform can build into that, but we're exploring many ways to accomplish, you know, taking it out of just native. So I don't want to say anything or make promises because, uh, you know, setting high expectations, laying people mm. down is far worse than just underselling and over-delivering. Yeah, so just say we're thinking say, about it. <laughs> well, we're actually exploring, you know, we are actually yeah. looking into a lot of these things and, and deep networking and architecture code, right? And that's what yeah. keeps us so busy. So I would say keep an eye out. That's what I would right. say. Well, the possibilities of what can be done on the web are increasing, you know, hugely as we go by. And Kalila, any, any moves on that front? Uh, Oh, that was Kalila. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's Caitlin. sorry, Caitlin. That's oh, all right. Yeah. But um, I'll, I'll take that as a compliment. We don't have these little flapping things over people's heads here. So I it's know. Get a bit yeah, confused. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, actually, I, I would answer similarly. You know, we're looking at a lightweight client that could um, would make it easier for people who don't have higher end VR, you know, rigs to be able to uh, experience things, especially in like the context of our classroom um, sort of experiments because you know not everyone necessarily has a high-end computer and it's not trivial to kind of dumb down the um, the current sort of core high fidelity VR platform to work really well on lower end gear. Um, <clears throat> so it would require the creation Seems of something. It could be like kind of a it'd be kind of a subset of the main application yeah. that would work on the web. I, I'm just, you know, so sort of visualizing this sort of future where we're, <laughs> we're talking about an interoperability, which sounds a bit strange, but imagine you've got a browser open and you've got five tabs and each tab right. is actually a web incarnation of a different virtual world. So you mm. can teleport from one world to the other by changing tabs. It might say, you know, like, yeah, yeah, that would be lovely. Be very odd. Our, but this brings me back to, that. I bring, yeah. Well, here, of course, I can bring Adam and uh, Lacey back in because Sansar, um, as well as being a standalone client, mm -hmm. does actually um, have a, a mobile and a web interface, as does um, ScienceBase. So I don't know about it. Do you have mobile as well? Or is it just a web interface, Adam? Uh, sorry, was that me or, or Lacey? Um, it, no, I couldn't remember whether you have both a web and a mobile. Yeah. Or we do. So we've got um, full native clients for iOS and Android, um, which are basically they are running the full viewer. Yeah. Um, we've had a web client using WebGL for a number of years. Now I could um, scream in various uh, languages for 30 minutes straight to complain about how bad uh, WebGL actually is. Um, at least if you want to do anything sort of high, high production values. But this year we've actually been playing around with uh, a new replacement for our web client, which is really good. Um, I can give you guys a demo uh, later. It's it's sort of in invite only, but come play a look with it uh, because we have been able to get the full client running with really fantastic quality graphics and stuff um, on on web this year, and it is really easy to get into these places. It's one of the things we're really looking forward to next year because the idea of sending a link to a friend and then having them join you in their browser instantly is so cool. Um, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And and uh, Lacey, the the Sansar version. This is, is um is, is this a similar sort of thing? Did you have to make a, a special porting of the code for? So uh, it's a uh, yeah. I mean, you, so you can attend events, um, kind of like the one that we had actually this time last weekend, um, with Elro and Boots House, and uh, you can actually attend the events on these mobile and browser. We actually had um. 1.2 million in attendance this past weekend and we were on the front page of twitch for 
uh, Maine's law for a couple hours. So, you know, it's, it's definitely wow. helpful for getting more bodies and more people enjoying uh, yeah. you know, these virtual events. Yeah, <laughs> when you talk in the thousands, you, you know, we realize how, how much stuff has changed, really. Though presumably they're not um, they're not fully embodied avatars, are they? They're sort of representational presences. Well, uh, they, they wouldn't be, um, you know, like um, avatars creating lag. You couldn't have thousands that way, could you? Or could you? So we have a, uh, a way that we can actually scale up. It's uh, called Avro, av short for Avatar Broadcasting. And so right. uh, you can make different you know, instances, but also have some of the people be broadcast to specific instances. So right. in that way, you can have interactivity. I mean, also with the chat and you know, reactions and all sorts of different ways without having to have you know, thousands of avatars stack up upon each other. Of course, um, yeah. But, you know, Avro allows this to go theoretically into the tens, thousands. I mean, it, it, basically as much as you want or it's could have. It's more or less the same as sharding, as it's called. Which, um, I mean, um, Adam, you have sharding, don't you? We do, but we've also been bringing up the concurrency in regions too. I've got another little demo project this year where we've been putting 500 plus avatars in a single scene. Um, we may actually be able to get up to about 1,700, we think. Ooh. And I can see them all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're all in the same, same as you. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of the visual fidelity of the actual avatars. Are they more like symbolic representations? Or are they uh, no, we're keeping full avatars. Um, it can crunch your graphics card, having that many in, in world at once. But um, yeah. I did a cool talk about that just the other day. Yeah. Now, uh, something else that you all have in common is um, I follow all four of you via Discord. I mean, obviously, some of you got Twitter accounts, and um, you post. Uh, in fact, in OpenSim here, I'm al I'm always getting Twitter announcements about an event that you know. By the time I read Twitter, it's been on for thirty minutes, you know, so I can't post it. But um, in Discord, it seems to be. And I mentioned this with uh, Ken Bai. I was interviewed yesterday. Um, <clears throat> It was started for gamers, and let's extend uh, any gaming technology to the virtual worlds. Um, it allows for voice, it allows for text, it allows for you to embed videos. You can even watch the videos together. You can do an awful lot, um, except, of course, it is not a virtual world in the terms of having avatars or whatever. But it does, you know, it, it does occur to me that if if we don't have the protocols to have interoperability amongst platforms, i.e., you know, different sound styles, <laughs> sine waves, etc. Um, then there is the, still the possibility for um, communication. I mean, I, this the idea of this first occurred to me way back early in Second Life when, um, oh, it must be a decade ago now, um, they bought out, um, it was actually hosted by Vivox. It was um, a separate client that was on your desktop, a bit like Skype. And you could message Second Life users and indeed phone them from this little widget um, this sort of default style widget. And the amazing thing is, unlike some of the web clients, you, it didn't require you, you know, it didn't stop you actually logging into the platform as well. It just rested like a Skype in your system tray. And I always found that was great because if you weren't in world, you had an instant way of contacting people. And I think Discord has sort of um, filled that little gap. At one time, it was meant to be, uh, you know, Slack, but um, that went in our direction and has now gone in an even greater direction. But um, um, I do find that it is kind of useful. Um, obviously, you can't just project yourself into a virtual world. Um, but let me see which is there is a platform. Yes, I think it's Tivoli, isn't it? That has a plug in and, and maybe clearly you have it too. There's a, a plug in in the code actually for Discord. So if you have Discord running whilst you actually come into the virtual world, it's, um, it activates Discord on, on top of your worldview. Oh, yeah. Well, we've, we've got something that simply just kind of reflects which world you're in, um, as well as uh, like in our Discord server. You can see um, which worlds are online and, and how many people are connected and that kind of thing. Uh, nothing like super tightly knit to Discord. 
but um, we really dig Discord both as a product and as a company and great community. So we're probably going to be looking at things we can do to to make them work a little more closely together. And I think, um, you know, so many platforms I get confused these days a bit, but I'm, I'm thinking, I think again, as Sansar here, uh, there's no obvious way to use text chat, for example, is uh, they see in Sansar. But I've, I have come across occasions where people can, uh, are actually having a text chat, but they're having it on the side in a Discord channel. It may not even be Sansar's Discord channel. It may be a Discord channel that's been set up by a venue or something like that. So, you know, people can um, actually, you know, talk in chat. I, I personally don't go with chat at all. I just like talking too much. But I mean, <laughs> I used to have a t-shirt <laughs> saying, I used to have a t-shirt saying, I don't do chat, you know, as a reply to all the people who said, I don't do voice, you know, when it came in. But <laughs> but some, several people at this conference have actually commented on the fact, and, and in fact, uh, Ken Bai mentioned it um, afterwards yesterday, mm -hmm. that, um, you know, he was, he was impressed by the fact that he was a presenter, so he got to the VIP bit here with the devs. And I don't know whether he fully knew what was going on, but he was commenting on it on its Twitter feed. I think it was that um, how empowering it was to actually have the live, fast-moving chat stream as well as people talking in voice at the same time. Oh yeah, like you, were, you were you were following two you know rapid conversations, um, probably better than you ever could in the real world. You know where you tend to concentrate on one thing at once. We uh, do have text chat, actually, and um, most of the time, uh, you know, if I'm multitasking, I do actually use it personally myself. Um, but no, uh, it's definitely important to have for accessibility. You know, some people prefer to just use text chat, and obviously that's that's cool. But, you know, um, also the voice chat option, especially for VR, uh, is very important. But Stanzar does have that text chat option, and that is um, usable and completely, uh, how do you put it, with the Avro system, um, it goes through all the different instances, so you can connect everybody, no matter what instances you are in. All right. Okay. Uh, but I mean, like many things, there's a menu item there hidden away somewhere that yet to be discovered by people like me. <laughs> but um, yeah, but that uh, that duality uh, works so well. Now, the other thing, the other thing that again, you, all your platforms have in common here, um, is the graphic fidelity. If you see what I mean, um, I you know Second Life and indeed Open Sim here have come along a bit of a way. You know they're they're, they're not too cartoony, but you know there's um, there, there's limits to you know how far they can go. I mean you can bring mesh in here, but it doesn't always play as well as mesh does in a dedicated platform um, like all of yours. In fact, um, Lacey, your um, your back end, as it were. The authoring software is, of course, the one that uh, Linden Labs built from scratch for their version of Sansar, which you've now inherited. Mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah, uh, we have our own engine. So when it comes to things like lighting effects and all the rest of it, you know, you can, um, um, you know, literally customize everything. I mean, it may be, you know, well, you know, it's far better than wind light. Let's put it that way. Uh, <laughs> And uh, the same with Adam, uh, first, uh, some of the first places I saw that Adam took me to in science space, you know, had been um, proudly built, <laughs> you know, with all sorts of mechanics going on and all sorts of wonderful lighting. And, um, uh, you know, uh, high fidelity, of course, ended up being the same. And subsequently, that's been passed down to, to Verde and um, Vicadia. Um, how important do you think the graphic fidelity um, uh, over and beyond the demands on the graphics card, but I mean, I just mean the general graphic fidelity is to the environment. There are some people who say, well, the avatar is not really important. It's just the fact that you're present with people and and the world can be quite simple. Like, um, oh, I forget, there's another successful platform this year. Um, I've forgotten his name offhand. Um, very basic, but very workable. And all your platforms, which are very rich environments, and, um, you know, you've got the avatar, but you're also in a very rich environment. How, how uh, important do you think this is? Do you ever get any feedback saying something silly, like make it simpler? <laughs> Let's start with, uh, I don't know, Caitlin. Sure. Um, well, 
in the case of uh, of Tivoli and probably for Vercadia and just the high fidelity VR platform in general and its derivatives, certainly uh, great looking graphics is important. Uh, but it's not really the only ingredient in the recipe for having a rich virtual world. Um, what I would say that is actually a little bit more important to us is the fact that the worlds are persistent. Mm -hmm. That, you know, you go and change something, you you break a stick on a tree, and that stick is broken when you return to that world. So we're not just, you know, throwing up kind of like diorama worlds that people can see and you know, and then it's reset and reloaded every time. So for us, I would say that persistence is really important um, as well as capturing like really the, the subtlety of, um, of avatar movement and voice and trying to capture the nuance there. So when we say high fidelity, and certainly when I was working at HiFi, what we were talking about wasn't as much of the, the graphics quality as it was the um, fidelity of the overall experience um, of the, the the nature of the human that comes through in the virtual world. That being said, we, we do want sexy graphics, but um, it'll be a while before, you know, either of us probably will be up to par with anything resembling what you can do with Unreal Engine or something like that. But if we wanted sexy graphics, we would probably just use a game engine uh, off the shelf rather than a custom written, um, you know, revolutionary core technology that stands out because it can provide the, the solutions that I just mentioned. Okay. Adam, Adam, same topic, really. The, the importance of the fidelity of the... Uh, yeah. So this one I can actually answer with some some empirical data. Um, it's, it's, oh yeah, do talk about the uh, volumetric stuff too. Well, no, no, uh, no. Even going backwards, just to the fidelity oh, of avatars. Sorry. So right. we actually yeah. um, we experimented this year um, to see what uh, what people would want, what they would tolerate um, in terms of avatar expression and um, just general general look and feel. Um, when we launched the the break room product that we did this year, which was sort of a, a corporate virtual world that you can just buy and dump off the shelf, uh, you can just put it in your infrastructure and and away you go. Um, we experimented with a whole bunch of different uh, theme packs for the people who bought them. Um, so some people bought a, a sort of a low poly, um, very simplified, basic characters, but uh, it was really well optimized for people on really old computers. And then we experimented with the high def stuff, um, doing sort of all the bells and whistles, the highest of the high. And uh, universally, customers ended up preferring the, the high def stuff. Um, we found that there was actually quite a strong negative reaction to cartoonified avatars, uh, that they really wanted as much realism as you could give them. Um, so there's there's uh, a little was this the, Sorry, just to do it. Do you think this was because this was a kind of enterprise offering as opposed to public or? Possible, but I think that the same hunt, uh, the same thing happens um, even otherwise. I mean, yeah. my usual go-to um, is to rag on Facebook's virtual worlds because they consistently keep screwing up the avatars, um, <laughs> and they consistently keep getting people saying the avatars are ugly. Uh, I don't know why they keep keep persisting um, with that design, but I think that holds true. I, I suspect that um, the avatar fidelity matters a lot more than people people give it credit for. I think especially, so, you know, you've got to go look at a second life to realize that there's a huge market for uh, what do you call it, the fashionistas, you know, people mm -hmm. buying and selling um, clothing and animations and all sorts of stuff like that. And, um, you know, that tells you that people in the social world want to be, you know, they want to be dress up and do things like they do in the real world. And so they, they, that demands a certain amount of realism. This avatar I'm wearing, by the way, this is uh, rather interesting for you folks there. Um, this is made for me and it looks a bit dated and unfinished, but this is my, I, I have an identical avatar. This same avatar is in, is in um, Tivoli and in Vicadia and in Sciespace. In fact, the only place it's not is Sansa, um, which is odd because we do the weekly news show from Sansa. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I know that James, by the way, um, Lacey, who does the camera with me and co-hosts the news, you know, so we've just become very keen on the environment in San so so quick mm -hmm. to get used to. And it just looks good on camera, even though we're just boring talking heads, you know, uh, mm -hmm. with screenshots. It's, um, it's, um, it's, we've taken to it, let's put it that way. Um, but, you know, we've travelled all over the place, so no favourites here. <laughs> yeah. Um, Right, moving on again, Adam. Before we came on air, you were um, you were telling me. Uh, I don't think we can actually put up web pages or links here on the screen behind us because we aren't prepared. But um, you tell me about the volumetric um, capture and um, you know as a way towards the future. And I, I mean, maybe you could contextualise that in something that is it something Sansar could uh, sorry um science space could use and maybe in if the answer is yes then it would it might be something the others here could use too yeah so the, i'm gonna go off on a slight tangent here um so we were talking a little about volumetric capture for, for the audience who weren't participating in our pre-core conversation uh, so volumetric capture is basically a real-time 3d capture you use a, a bunch of stereo cameras and um you record the person doing whatever they're doing um from a bunch of ang bunch of angles and you actually use photogrammetry to turn that into a real-time streaming 3d model uh, so it looks and and acts fantastically it's really cool technology um there's a bunch of companies working on on great stuff there microsoft um have really been commercializing it more than anyone else but intel and a few other companies have been doing some some cool stuff in the space uh to answer the question if you can support it yep i mean we've been experimenting with it um there's a bunch of ways of getting that that content into science base already today um but real-time live capture is the stuff we're interested in but i'm going to go off on a bit of a tangent there because we talked a bit about uh, sort of zoom fatigue and i think the biggest part of zoom fatigue that virtual worlds don't suffer from is the need to be on camera um, when you are on a zoom call and you've got your camera on you are constantly watching yourself you're making sure that uh thinning hair is not not appearing in the in the camera <laughs> shots you're making sure you're not slacking off you're not uh doing anything i mean right now i've got my in my hands i'm fidgeting it's like it's like, it's like looking in the mirror isn't it you've just yeah, it got, is. it's, got a pre it is a mental load um so i think that for day-to-day -day use i can't see us using 3d volumetric capture I think that it is not something that people are going to be comfortable with. It is yet another level of invasiveness beyond video. I mean, video is already pretty invasive, but for certain things, I think it'll work fantastically. And the, one of them is live music, live events, yeah. um, those kinds of things where you've got a performance going on and a performer, that kind of thing, the, the 3D volumetric capture is just amazing. It is really I mean, next gen stuff. Presumably, and I, 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 I'm remembering what happened in Sansar here with the Glastonbury thing, presumably you could imp implement the volumetric capture on, say, a parcel that's like a stage, but it won't actually necessarily affect the surrounding areas where the audience might be. Um, because I, I'm thinking when I went to uh, Glastonbury in Sansar, um, I mentioned it earlier, um, they, 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 well, they were pre-recorded, unfortunately, but the, the real-world bands were filmed against a, a, a green screen and they were then projected into the virtual world against a virtual background several layers of background in fact and um on the edge of the stage and then the audience was in the audience and it was as a member of the audience it wasn't until you got your nose right up to the edge of the stage you know groupie style <laughs> that yes. you realized that there was no third dimension to the band it was actually video but it seemed seamless against the background because it was green screened now it occurs to me obviously that if that had happened in sansa and they had this volumetric type capture the performers and only the performers would, instead of being that flat video um, against the background, could actually be more like holograms. Um, you know, where you could be at the front of the stage and you could still move left to right and still get the sense of looking around them. Oh, yeah. I'd like to also mention that um, you can actually perform on the green screen fully live in Sansar. Uh, you know, so we do a mix of both. Yeah. Uh, it's obviously easier for logistics to record it in advance when you've got a big event. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so presumably in both sides space. And how, I mean, Caitlin and Kalila, do you, uh, do, do you know anything about this, the volumetric capture thing? If you, is it something that's come across your radar in development? 
Uh, well, it's not necessarily come across too much. I mean, in terms of immersion and bringing people in, something that's been a focus is things like eye tracking, finger tracking, uh, maybe even face capture would be something at some point. But yeah. volumetric, I think, is a bit tricky. And so I agree <laughs> with what was said earlier that, you know, it kind of betrays some of the major points of VR, which is avatars. You know, you get to present yeah. yourself as something that you mean to, right? You're not just stuck with the physical realm and however physicality has decided that you'll be, you know, you'll look and present yourself. Uh, avatars free you. So if we take so. your emotions and project that into an avatar, I think that's not a compromise. I think that's invaluable. I think that's something that people seek out. And I would like to push that forward a lot more. Right. Yeah, I think it's a case of what happens on stage too. It um, can be a separate thing. I remember when Philip did the, the, they had that sort of big, I can't remember what you called it now, that big festival a year or two ago in High Fidelity. And, um, uh, sorry? Was it Multicon? No, it was actually like an outdoor festival. There were several different stages and you wandered around. And oh, um, what's his name played? Um, oh, God, I'm getting too old for this. My memory is fading. Oh, Thomas Dolby? Thomas Dolby, that's it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and, that was um, the Futurelands Festival. Futurelands, that was it. Yeah. And, um, you know, I can imagine something done that quite that big, you know, it will be it will be fun to do a bit with the stage that they they didn't do in that occasion. I mean, um, the, the rather unsuccessful thing there was that um, Dolby's own performance sound was mixed in with the people gossiping next to me <laughs> you know you couldn't get you can turn down the volume of the people next to you to get a clean audio from the performer and also the stage was very close up but i was i was imagining that that sort of event you know you could partition performance areas to um you know encompass a different technology as it were um, in a particular instance. Now I've got I've got one final question to ask, and this is probably going to make it a really dumb question because I don't develop or code or do any of these things. But I I'd had thoughts, and just checking the time here. Yeah, um, I'd had thoughts about what if I built a mesh construct? I don't know, maybe a house or something with um, a TV and a telephone system or something in it, right? Maybe an open sim here, maybe somewhere else. But the idea was that, like my avatar here, I could deploy it in multiple platforms. What if inside this mesh, be it an avatar or a building, there was code running that was totally independent of the platform you were in? Uh, it's tactically, it's a, it's a probably a fanciful way, and it probably wouldn't work. But that, I'm wondering, is that a way of approaching interoperability where you put interoperable components in, say, a mesh object that would be reservable, as it were, in multiple worlds. Your thoughts on that, if, I, if, if it makes any sense at all? <laughs> well, uh, I'll, I'll field this one first, and then, then yeah. can I apply for other people? Um, so the, the short answer is it, it works for, for a lot of things. Um, when we launched back in, what was it, November 2016, um, we basically had uh, scripting provided through a series of sort of blocked components. So there was components for vehicles, for seats, for everything like with that. We think we've had about 300 components um, around that, that mark um, that each had sort of some discrete functionality that can be tweaked and customized, but they were all sort of building blocks that, that everyone could use. And it worked pretty well. Um, for a lot of users, you were able to get the things you needed. Um, there was components for all the common, common functionality. One of the problems though, is that eventually you hit the point that people want to completely rebuild whatever component you've built and do their own tweaked Tweak thing, and that's the right, point at which break compatibility here. That's the point at which um, you need to have a, a common scripting runtime. The web has one in its, its JavaScript, um, both the, the actual language and the um, SDK that the browsers ship with them. 
Uh, and that would be what you need to do for really, really complex interop. But for basic interop, it definitely can be done. You can satisfy probably 90% of users. On it's, it's, uh, yeah, we're, we're down, to the, <laughs> down to the edge here. Um, yeah, we're going to be thrown off in a minute. Um, yeah, it occurred to me that, you know, last year we mentioned how OpenSim can be used as a construction platform to export a mesh that would then later end up in somewhere like Science Space. And I, I was thinking in terms of what you could put into a studio here. Anyway, I'm afraid we have to wrap. The, you, you know, 50 minutes is never never long enough especially for a panel um so uh, that's going to be it um thanks for watching everybody um thank you to lacy from sansa thank you lacy thank you and thank you caitlin from tivoli cloud you are very welcome and thanks for having us yeah thank you adam from science space thank you for having me again and lastly, thank you to Kalila from Vicadia. Well, it's been lovely. Thank you for hosting. And with that, I'll throw over to, um, I, get, I think Leah is still here to do the I obligation sure roundup. <laughs> they do a hey, roundup thing. <laughs> absolutely. Thank you to our panelists and to Mal for a terrific session.